Tonight, the family targeted in an arson attack on their home. The devastating fire killed a father and his two children. Only the mother survived. Everything that I loved has gone. Nothing is going to change. Can you tell us who did it? Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. We're going to have more on that dreadful arson attack in just a moment. But first, a look ahead to tonight's other appeals. As ever, we've got a studio just full of detectives waiting to take your calls. Amongst them, officers from the Royal Military Police. They're here to find anyone who might have witnessed the appalling rape of a teenage girl on a military base in Germany. It happened back in 1974. Later, we'll have some great news on convictions as a direct result of your calls to us. They include these thugs who attacked and stabbed a shopkeeper in North London. And Rav is here with lots of new wanted faces and his CCTV. Yep, we've got people wanted for drug dealing, armed robbery and even defrauding a pensioner of her lottery winnings. Plus some incredible CCTV, including this guy who fought back against thieves raiding his jewellery shop. And we'll also have a reconstruction of the moments leading up to the rape of a young woman in Waltham Cross in Hertfordshire. He was like asking me what's wrong and that, talking like he actually cared. I just couldn't believe it happened. I shouldn't have been so gullible. But I just wanted to get home. Terrible. Someone must recognise that man. And Matthew, what have you got for us? Well, it's the inside story of how detectives caught the sadistic hair-in-hand killer Danilo Restivo, who placed strands of another woman's hair in the palms of his victim. While they built the case against him, police were so concerned he'd kill again, they placed him under round-the-clock surveillance. He was uh, out effectively stalking lone females. I sent down a couple of uniform officers. Chillingly, they found a large filleting knife, two pairs of scissors, gloves, balaclava, his murder bag. Terrifying. More on that coming later. First, uh, take a look at these incredible specimens. There's been a space of thefts recently of rhino horns from museums all around the UK. They are worth twice as much as gold. Can you help identify the gang responsible? We start tonight with the truly shocking arson attack on the home of a family of four in Helensborough in the west of Scotland. The Sharkey family were targeted two months ago in the early hours of Sunday, July the 24th. The father, Thomas, and his two children were killed. Thomas Jr., aged 21, and Bridget, who's just eight. Only the mother, Angela, survived, and she has spoken to Crime Watch in the hope that anyone who knows who started the fire will call in tonight. I have no idea why anyone would want to do this to me and my family. It's just so unfair that they're gone. This flat in Helensborough in West Scotland was home to the Sharkey family. Tommy and Angela and their two children, Thomas and Bridget. But as they all slept during the early hours of a Sunday morning in July, someone did the unthinkable and deliberately set fire to their home. I was proud of my children, immensely proud. Thomas Jr. had just turned 21 in May and he was doing a golf scholarship in Georgia and I missed him. He went to America. He was just finished his second year and he'd planned to go back in August. He was well mannered. Just everything that a mother could want her son to be. Bridget was a wee surprise, a good one. She loved um, dancing and singing and she was a live wire. 
She would have been nine this month. Bridget, she was a lovely little girl. She was really bubbly and she had everybody wrapped around her finger. She had this wee twinkle in her eye that just made you fall in love with her the instant you seen her. Bridget and Angela, they were like best friends. Mother and daughter plus best friends. Everybody thinks their own children are brilliant, but she was. The day before the fire, young Thomas had been to golf. All right, Mom. So he was at home, as I was. Bridget had gone to her wee friends for a sleepover. You went again, did you, son? Mm -hmm. High five under five. It was just quite a normal day. A wee bit late to the wait up, right? They were a great family. That's all they wanted, family life. Normally, with Bridget, sleepovers ended about 10 o'clock when she decided she missed her mummy and wanted to come home. Just hold on a second. At 10 o'clock, the phone rang, and it was her friend's parents saying she's not settling. I knew she'd be back home before midnight, missing her mummy. Young Thomas went downstairs and collected her from her wee friend's dad. Oh, sweetheart. Oh, sweetheart. Oh, Up to bed. Bridget went to bed first, settled down, no problem. Thomas Jr. went to bed not long after Bridget, and I followed them up not long after again. Their father, Tommy Sr., spent the evening in his local pub. He left after closing and would have got home at around 1 a.m. speed, creating clouds of thick black smoke. The staircase next to the front door acted like a chimney, funneling the toxic smoke into the children's bedrooms. <laughs> Alerted by an off-duty policeman, fire crews arrived at the flat within 10 minutes of the fire starting but it was already too late. And at seven o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call to say that Thomas's house had been on fire. Young Bridget didn't make it. She died on the way to the hospital. And young Thomas, he was pronounced dead at the scene. My whole body inside was shaken because it's so hard to take in. Tommy Sr. managed to get out through a first-floor window, but he died just a few days later from pneumonia caused by breathing in the smoke. Angela was found unconscious in her bed. She was taken to hospital, where she lay in a coma for two weeks. I don't remember any, any fire shouting, anything. I went to bed. End of story. Detective Superintendent Peter McPike is leading the murder investigation. Peter, we're inside the flat where the Sharkies used to live. I mean, the damage is colossal. It is. It's really extensive. You can see just how far the fire has spread, how much damage has been caused by the flames and by the smoke, and how thick the smoke must have been in the house. What would the temperatures have been like in here? Fire service estimate that at the height, bearing in mind we were in a confined space here, that the, the temperatures would have reached in excess of 900 degrees. 900? In fact, the whole, the whole front door was absolutely, completely consumed by the fire. Now, police are working with fire officers on tests to try to establish exactly how this blaze might have been started. 
My goodness, the intensity and the speed of that, it, it's frightening. Yeah, it is absolutely frightening. And that's one of the things that struck the inquiry team as well, is just how quickly the fire took effect. And you can see that really within seconds, there's a really well-established fire that produces really thick black smoke. And in fact, that's what we believe killed the children. Now, a test like this, what, what are you actually trying to find out? How, in fact, the fire was started. That's the main thing. And the other point is to really narrow down the timings and just work out exactly when the fire might have been set. I didn't know how ill I had been, how close I was to being dead as well. No recollection of fire, smoke, shouting, anything. It was actually Angela's sister who told her the horrible news. How do you even begin to tell somebody that everything they'll, they've loved, have, they've lost? And it was just like, phew, can't be true. Their faces. Um, and then it just went downhill from there on in, really. It's now two months since the fire, and detectives are urgently trying to trace several potential witnesses who were seen in the area at around the same time as the fire was started. At 4.43 a.m., a man was seen on CCTV walking down John Street towards the Sharkey's flat. 24 minutes later, at 5.07, what looks like the same person walks back the other way. At around the same time, a van driver saw a man walking from West Princess Street up what's known locally as Rowett's Lane. It would mean everything to me and my family to catch the person that did this, for us to be able to bury the kids in Thomas, because we can't do that just now. Anyone that could do this to anybody needs to be stopped from doing it again, because it's torture. The enormity of losing two children. It's tricky <laughs> to deal with. And I've not even began to think about how much I'm going to miss my husband because I loved him a bit and he loved me. It's just no fair. Angela has nothing left. She has lost her husband, her two kids, her home. This is beyond evil. It is horrendous. This arson attack has devastated a family killing a father and his two children. What police need to know now is why. It's still sinking. I've got to face it, but it'll be made easier if somebody can explain to me why they felt they need to go this far. Everything that I loved has gone. Nothing's going to change. Everything she loved is gone. Detective Superintendent Peter McPike joins us now here in the studio. It's unbelievable that somebody would set fire to a house. It's entirely unbelievable somebody would set fire to a home with children. Well, that's right. That's been the, the focus of the investigation from the very start, is to establish exactly why this has happened. You heard uh, Angela in the reconstruction there asking that very question about why it happened. Now, clearly we know that um, Tommy, her husband, um, had a criminal past and he did have criminal associates, and that's obviously a main line of the investigation, is to establish exactly why this happened. OK. Um, all of these innocent victims, uh, here it is your belief that there are people with vital information in the community who have not come forward? We are absolutely convinced that there are people in the local Helensborough community who do have information about this and who perhaps may not have come forward um, due to some sort of uh, perhaps misplaced loyalty, but I would be absolutely astonished that anybody can be experiencing misplaced loyalty when we're talking about the murder of an eight-year-old child. That's for sure. Uh, you were talking there with Matthew in the film about the ferocity of this fire, 900 degrees. You're working very closely with the fire service. Why is that? Um, two, two things, really. First of all, to establish uh, how the fire was set, and secondly, equally importantly, is to establish um, 
as best we can just exactly when the fire was set. Uh, and an important point to bear in mind as well is that the fire service tells us that the, the person responsible um, might indeed have suffered some sort of burn perhaps to the hands or to the face or uh, burn to hair or eyebrows. And, and I would appeal to anybody who knows someone who suffered those types of injuries around about the time of this fire, please to contact the police. OK, that could be a very big clue. Just very briefly, you're looking for witnesses. Let's quickly take a look at some pictures. Um, these are four boys seen in the area of um, East Princess Street, about quarter past four, near to the train station. Uh, they're out and about walking in the general direction of the scene. We've still to trace them. OK, one more picture. Uh, these two uh, men are seen about ten to five in the morning in the area of East King Street, again walking in the general direction of the scene. We would appeal to them or anybody who knows them to come forward. They need to talk to you. They might have vital information they don't even know about. For now, Peter, thank you very much. You have seen what has happened to Angela's family, the tragedy, the suffering she is going through. If you know anything about it... You must speak to our detectives tonight. Please do call. Here's the number, 0500 600 600. Or you could call the independent charity Crime Stoppers. Do that anonymously. 0800 555 one is their number. Now, Rav has his first collection of wanted faces. And first is Stuart Horsfield, who's wanted in relation to the supply of heroin and cocaine worth more than £5 million in Doncaster last year. 52-year-old Horsfield has links across South Yorkshire and to the Spanish island of Gran Canaria. Next is a man known to some as Abdella Imensa, but he also uses various aliases. The 50-year-old is wanted in connection with the repeated rape of a young girl, which dates back more than 10 years. He's previously worked as a high-end tailor and is linked to the London borough of Newham and Lagos in Nigeria. Now, police urgently need to trace these two. This is Kirk Trevor Bradley and Anthony Tony Downs. They escaped from a prison van in Manchester in July. At the time, the pair were standing trial at Liverpool Crown Court. Both have strong Liverpudlian accents, and Bradley has a scar on the left side of his face and several scars on his right hand, while Downs has a two-inch scar on his right cheek. Both are considered dangerous and should not be approached. If you see them or know where they are, call police immediately. Now, all of tonight's Wanted Faces are on the website, bbc.co.uk forward slash crimewatch. And if you know where they are, 0500 600 600. Or you can text 63399 crime space and then your message. Now, on to a very unusual case. It stretches back to the 1970s, to the city of Detmold in Germany. Not the usual jurisdiction of the British police, but this is an appeal for help with an investigation into the rape of a child of a British military family. It happened on an army housing estate in Germany. Staff Sergeant Michelle Pike from the Royal Military Police is here to explain more. Because we're not entirely familiar with the sort of work you do, explain a bit more about it, Michelle. Mm -hmm. The Royal Military Police have jurisdiction over military personnel and sometimes members of their families when they are based overseas. We investigate all types of incidents, including some which are very serious. Yeah, and this one seems pretty serious. It's an allegation of a rape that took place in the 1970s, 1974. Tell us a bit more. Yes, we have been contacted by the daughter of a British soldier who served in Germany in the 70s. Their family home was a flat on the married quarter estate called the Hackendal in Germany, the main camp in that area being near Detmold. The victim was a teenager at the time and she has told us that in 1974 she and a female friend were babysitting for another British military family on the estate. During the evening, four British teenage boys came round to the flat. She let them in but then they raped her. Unfortunately, the attack did not come to the attention of the authorities at that time. OK, it's probably worth letting people know tonight, Michelle, that the victim has only come forward now because her parents have passed away. Very courageously, she's spoken to us and she describes what happened. It was like, it was jovial. It was fun for them. Without any fuss, within a few minutes, they carried me through to the bedroom, left my friend in the living room with the door shut. They stripped me off to a pair of trainers and then one by one took turns to have sex with me. So, Michelle, your appeal tonight is for possible witnesses, yeah? Yes, we would like to locate the female friend of the victim who was in the flat while the attack took place. Some years later, we do understand that she approached the victim and apologised for not doing more to help. Okay. Sadly, the victim has now lost contact with her friend, and so we would like to locate her and find out what she saw. Okay. We are not linking her at all to the offence. And you're also looking for any teenagers who might have heard about the attack? Yes, we would also like to speak to any other teenagers who may have been told about what happened 
or who were also there to come forward. OK, for now, Michelle, thank you very much. If you know anything, please do call us tonight. You know the number. It's 0500 600 600. And indeed, if you've been a victim of crime, there is the victim support line. They're always there. Here's the number, 0845 30 30 900. Now, Rav's got some CCTV for you to take a quick look at. And we start in Edinburgh. This is Waverley Railway Station in December 2009. Take a look at this pair making their way towards the station platforms. As the woman reaches the top of the escalator, she inexplicably presses the emergency stop button. As the escalator comes to a sudden halt, a female pensioner is catapulted forward and seriously injured as a result. The woman who hit the button looks down, sees what's happened and hurries off. The pensioner broke both her wrists and is now disabled. We need to find the woman responsible and her mate, so tell us who they are tonight. A Thursday night in June this year, outside the Portrait Public House in Sidcup in Kent. A group of people are chatting and smoking outside. The guy in the white trainers fancies himself as a bit of a boxer, playfully punching one girl and showing off his moves. But things turn nasty when he suddenly lashes out at one of the men. The force of the punch broke the victim's jaw in two places. Were you there that night? Or do you know who this man is? Name, please. A gang of four masked men burst into the Kampala jeweler's shop in Leicester just over a week ago. They smashed the display cabinets with hammers, grabbing handfuls of gold rings. But the owner isn't giving up his stock easily and fights back with a baseball bat, chasing them out into the street and damaging their top-of-the-range getaway van. They nicked 30 grand's worth of jewellery and need to be found. Who are they? And that footage is all on the website. And if you know who any of them are, call 0500 600 600 or text 63399, type crime, space, and then your message. OK, it's time now for some updates on cases that we featured previously. First, excellent news on an appeal from February. The terrifying sexual assault of a young woman in Manchester city centre last October. We showed you this CCTV of the man seen following her that night. And after seeing himself on the programme, 26-year-old Dominic Hill of Burnage handed himself in. He's now been sentenced to five years and four months in prison for that attack. In May, we showed you this CCTV of a female bus driver being punched in the face at London's Euston bus station. The suspect also saw himself on the programme and handed himself in. He's 19-year-old Jowan Hassan from Orpington in Kent and he was given a four-month suspended prison sentence and has been electronically tagged. Great result. Now, almost a year ago, we featured an armed robbery in Camberbatch in Cheshire, during which a postmaster was seriously hurt. Well, last month, a 28-year-old man appeared in court charged with violent armed robbery. We will, of course, let you know how that one progresses. And finally, for now, you may remember this sparkler from our last programme. Well, after the show, Kelly Osborne, daughter of Ozzy and Sharon, suggested it might have been her mum's ring which was stolen in a burglary in 2004. Well, unfortunately, after lengthy investigations involving experts from the jewellers Tiffany, it's been confirmed that it's not Sharon's diamond. South Yorkshire Police continue to appeal for information about that ring and several other pieces. All the information is on the website. Now, you may remember this face here. Back in May, we appealed for your help in finding 52-year-old Ang Tieng Du. He's wanted in connection with the horrific murder of a family of four in Northampton. Jeff, Helen, Nancy and Alice Ding were all stabbed to death in their home. It happened on April 29th. You'll remember that was the day of the royal wedding. The rest of their family is devastated, and Jeff's brother Ji Shang has spoken emotionally of his shock. I want to ask him, how could you step a knife into an innocent girl's heart? Not once, but twice. Okay, here we how go. could you do that? Well, I'm joined now by Detective Superintendent Glyn Timmons from Northamptonshire uh, Police. Uh, Glyn, this is obviously a huge and significant investigation to find this man. Um, you've got some footage that you haven't shown before. Let's take a look at it and tell us what it is you're showing people tonight. 
What we're seeing there is a suspect walking along Venable Street. It's 2.27 on Saturday the 30th of April. He's not long abandoned the silver cross he took from the family home. And we can see he's still wearing that distinctive three-quarter length brown coat and the white Burberry hat. OK, so that was in the Edgware Road and he was abandoning the family's Vauxhall course. If anybody saw that, you want to hear from them. Um, has he been seen since? We've investigated uh, something like 300 sightings. Okay. One in particular that we're really interested in at the moment is one not long after the murders, which is in Gibraltar. OK, uh, just give people a quick round-up. Let's remind people of what this man looks like. Right, Ang Zheng Du is a 52-year-old Chinese male. He's five foot nine inches tall, slim build. He's got a receding hairline that he often covers with a cap. OK. There, there is something uh, important we want to show people tonight. It looks a bit odd, but actually it's, it's an artist's impression of the sole of one of the shoes that was left at the scene of the crime. That's right. It's actually a scientist's drawing based on a footwear mark found at the scene. We think it comes from a handmade shoe, and I'm really hoping someone can recognise that pattern. Yes, it's a distinctive pattern. If you've been involved in the making of a shoe like that, then we want to or hear from you tonight. Or repairing of a shoe. Or repairing yeah. of a shoe, indeed. Thanks very much for now, Glyn. If you've got any idea where Ang Tsiang Du might be, then please do call us. The usual number, 0500 600 600. Now, Rav has got some more CCTV. Now, you may have seen our special programme in August following the outbreaks of rioting and looting in several English cities. Well, the Met alone still have 100,000 hours of CCTV to wade through, so here's just a very small selection of what they're looking at. It's the 8th of August at 9.55 in the evening, and the Richer Sound store on East Street in Bromley catches the attention of a group of looters. The gang begin kicking their way through the shutters before pouring in to get the loot. Firstly, they strip the walls of all the televisions before completely ransacking the whole shop. Once outside, one looter gets away with a screen. The other seems to get the remote. Let's hope they're friends, eh? Name these mindless thieves. Next, JD Sports at the Plassey Retail Park in Lewisham in South London. A few people make inroads into the shop door and then it becomes a frenzy. Seemingly out of nowhere, dozens of people decide it's their time to help themselves to sportswear. Remember, this is broad daylight in a busy shopping centre and they couldn't care less. Names, please. Still in Lewisham and this electrical shop becomes a target. The brazen way these people help themselves to stuff is breathtaking. Some even end up scrabbling with each other for the spoils. But once again, we've got them caught on camera. Who are they? Now over to Ealing in West London. This gang are using pub signs and lampposts to smash their way into Tesco's on Haven Green just before 11pm. As they pour through the window, some only get away with a few small items. Perhaps they think every little helps. At the same time, at this restaurant just down the road, more looters. The delight on their faces as they lift bottles of wine is clear to see. But the happy hour's over. Names, please. A little later that night in Ealing in Bond Street, and the rioters here are intent on causing as much damage as possible. Some set fire to rubbish. Others decide that's not enough and target cars with drastic results. This man seems delighted with his actions. Let's wipe that smile off his face. And this is inside PC World in Croydon. Expensive computers are clearly a draw for the looters. The force with which they ram the door shows how intent they are on getting in. They then pile into the shop, stripping it of its contents in double-quick time. Crash their party and name them tonight. And individual still images of everyone caught in that CCTV are on bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. If you know them, call the usual number 0500 600 600 or you can text 63399, type crime space and then your message. Right, still to come tonight, the young woman who didn't have enough cash for a taxi home and accepted the help of this man. They were in the centre of Walsham Cross when he led her into an alley and raped her. Rav has also got lots more CCTV and Matthew has the latest of his films on how a major case was solved. Yes, police long suspected that this man, Danilo Restivo, had brutally murdered and mutilated 
48-year-old mum of two, Heather Barnett, leaving strands of other women's hair in her hands. But it took nearly a decade before they had enough firm evidence to charge him. Several victims of his strange fetish responded to a Crime Watch appeal, and their evidence, along with developments in forensic technology, would prove to be Restivo's final undoing. Also, can you name the gang raiding museums across Europe to steal rhino horns? They're selling them on for hundreds of thousands of pounds to be used in Chinese medicine. That's all coming up very soon. But first, Matthew has the latest on what's been happening on the phones. Yeah, it's really busy. Let's interrupt Peter investigating that arson attack. I know you've had a lot of calls, interesting calls. We have indeed. We've had several calls suggesting the identity of some of the boys we've appealed for in the, in the CCTV. One caller um, who phoned in talking about the, the male in the hooded top walking away from the scene. I'd really appeal for that caller to phone back again. Because and you've we had believe a that. name, is that right? Uh, we've had a name for one of the boys seen earlier on near to the scene as well. Yes, that's right. And I would really appeal to people to please remember this is the mother of a father and a son and a daughter. Peter, I can see that your phone is going again. I'll let you get away. Thanks, Thanks very much. Rav, over to you. Thanks, Matthew. Time now for some more wanted faces. And first of all, we've got Robert Worrell, who police want to speak to in relation to an armed robbery at a Sainsbury's in Bexley Heath in Kent at the end of last month. 32-year-old Worrell has links to Woolwich, Thamesmead and Greenwich and he's considered dangerous, so don't approach him. Just call police. A reward of up to 10 grand is on offer for information leading to his arrest and prosecution. Next is Archibald O'Doom. The 59-year-old is wanted in connection with GBH committed against his ex-partner. O'Doom also has links to Thamesmead as well as Barking and Stoke on Trent and is considered a danger to women. If you know where he is, call us right now. Number seven is Stephen Paul Carroll. The 32-year-old is sought after absconding from prison and is wanted in relation to serious offences in the northwest of England. He's from the Highton area of Liverpool and may still have connections there. He's considered to be dangerous, so if you see him, call the police immediately. And lastly, over here is Mohammed Reza Bashiri. He's been convicted of trying to defraud and blackmail an 83-year-old pensioner out of her lottery winnings. 40-year-old Bashiri, an Iranian national, has links to Birmingham and the Southwark and Queensway areas of London. Let's hope we get a lot of calls about him tonight. So, 0500 600 600 if you recognise any of them, or text 63399, crime, space, and then your message. And remember, they all stay online until they're caught. Now, in July, a young woman was on her way home from a night out with friends and she got a night bus from central London to the Hertfordshire town of Walsham Cross. What she didn't realise was that one of her fellow passengers would go on to rape her. This is Waltham Cross in Hertfordshire, a commuter town just outside the M25, a few miles north of London. Late at night, it's fairly quiet, apart from a few people using the night buses that come in from the capital. In the early hours of the 4th of July, one of these passengers was a 20-year-old woman. Short of cash and unsure of the area, she relied on strangers' offer of help to get her home. It was a decision she bitterly regrets. That day, my friends rang me to see if I wanted to go out with them, so I went uh, to London to meet them. I thought the last train was half 12, but it was at half 11, so I missed the last train back. Someone suggested that I could get the bus back to uh, Wolven Cross, which would get me closer to home. The bus journey was just a normal bus journey, just like nothing out of the ordinary. Wolverine Cross is the last stop on the bus, so I got off there. Unsure of what to do next, she asked the driver for help. Hi, do you know where I can 
before approaching a taxi to find out how much it would cost to get home. It was 30 quid, but I only had £10 on me. I didn't have a bank card and my phone had no credit. There was no buses. Was, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Becoming distressed as she realised she had no means of getting home, the woman was unaware that someone was watching her every move. This man had been on the same bus, but instead of carrying on his journey, he hangs around, watching as she grows increasingly upset. OK, thanks. I'm sorry. CCTV footage shows the man standing on the pavement, watching as she speaks to the taxi driver. phone box inside the shelter and I went in there to ring my dad but he didn't answer his phone. After she enters the bus terminal, he stands in the doorway watching intently as she searches her bag. You lost? Uh, hi, yeah, I'm just trying to get home. What, you need direction? Like He's, like, asking me what's wrong and that. Talking like he actually cared, do you know what I mean? Like, I like concerned. I live, like, five minutes off the road, I can talk After about saying he's going to lend me the rest of the money to get home, we went to walk through Townway, where he said he had to go to his, to get the money from, and then he just asked me to wait as he went to get it. I thought he weren't going to come back. But then a minute, a minute and a half, he come back and he said he'd show me the cut through back to the taxi rank. Yeah, this is the shortcut to the taxi rank. And then we went round the back way through this alley bit. Be quiet, yeah, and this will be over quickly. Yeah. No. Be quiet. No. I froze. I don't know. I think now. I could have done a lot more to prevent it. <laughs> but literally, it was over with like a minute, minute and a half, and then it just ran off. I just couldn't believe that it happened. <laughs> He raped her here, just off the high street, before disappearing. Were you in the area that night? Did you see which way he went? When the victim was sure he was gone, she made her way through Lodge Crescent and out onto the high street to call the police. I didn't know exactly where I was and that. I went straight to the phone box, rang the police. My wife and I were in bed, uh, just dozing off the phone obviously startled me um, and all I heard was of, uh, the words of my daughter uh, saying, Dad, I've been raped. My daughter's growing up, obviously she's a young lady now, but in our eyes she's still a little girl and I didn't know what to say. And it was just those three or four words and then it was the ambulance crew saying, your daughter's here. <laughs> she's now got to carry this burden and, it, and it's not just her, it's the whole family that's carrying that. That shouldn't have been so gullible. I just wanted to get home. What a terrible ordeal. With me now is Detective Inspector Steve Keating. Um, this poor young woman, obviously, she's berating herself for ever trying to take advice and help from this man. That's right. She was attacked when she was extremely vulnerable. Um, she was taken advantage of by someone knowing that she had no means of getting home and uh, must be caught tonight. Uh, yes, he must be. Um, he's a very dangerous man, Steve, and the good news is that we have got some very important and very clear CCTV pictures of yes, the man. Yes, that's right. Um, it was taken from the same bus that she was travelling upon. It was the N279 from central London to Waltham Cross. He got on the bus at Tottenham High Road at approximately 12.45am. He used an Oyster card to pay for his journey. Right. Uh, it's unregistered and... Um, it was later topped up at a newsagent in Waltham Cross at the Pavilion Shopping Centre. OK, the good news is that what this guy is wearing is incredibly distinctive. Let's just take a closer look at this bright green T-shirt. That's right, it's a distinctive G-Star T-shirt. 
and he was carrying a JD Sports bag. Yes, both of those things, really distinctive. You would remember this book. That's right. um, you also have CCTV that sort of tracks the journey of these two people to Waltham Cross. That's right. He was hanging around at the bus station and while well, she was trying to find a way of getting home. Uh, and that was about 1.25 in the morning. The pair then walked off together from the bus station through the town centre via Edna Cross Road. At that point, they've um, arrived in the high street and uh, that was just minutes before the attack. OK, where do you think this uh, man ran off to after the attack? We believe it's Lodge Crescent uh, or one of the rows just off there. Um, it's approximately one forty-five in the morning. OK, Steve, for now, thanks very much. Someone surely is going to recognise this man. The pictures are so clear. If it's you, I would urge you to call now, 0500 600 600. Again, if you've been a victim of crime, the victim support line is 0845 30 30 900. I have to tell you that I'm being told we've had a, a vital call tonight that's come in uh, to our team about the Helensborough arson. If you are the person who phoned about the Helensborough arson saying that you saw somebody running from the scene at 5 a.m., I would urge you, please, to call us again tonight. You didn't leave your number. We're unable to contact you, and it is vital we talk to you tonight. Please do call in. Now it's over to Rav with some more criminals caught on camera. Yep, and we begin this time with a cowardly attack in Westminster. This shocking footage shows a gay couple being viciously attacked by a group of four men who had been following them as they made their way home along Charing Cross Road on a Tuesday night in August this year. This was a violent homophobic assault and those responsible need to be caught. Name them tonight. Now many people enjoy a spot of window shopping and this guy seems no different. He has a good look at the display before entering this jeweller's shop in Bridge North, Shropshire, in July. He asks the female assistant to show him a silver chain from the window. As she bends down to retrieve it, he leans over her and grabs a tray of 15 diamond rings, hiding it in his jacket before running off. Do you know this diamond geezer? Be a gem and give us a ring tonight. You know what to do, 0500 600 600 or you can text 63399, type crime space and then your message. Busy night, OK, now some more news on previous appeals. Well, we start with a development in a case we last featured three years ago. 17-year-old schoolgirl Shafilia Ahmed's body was discovered by workmen on the banks of the River Kent in Cumbria in February 2004. She'd been missing for five months. Well, earlier this month, Shafilia's parents, who deny any involvement, were arrested and charged with her murder. The court case is likely to take place in the new year. In April last year, we showed 20-year-old Amrula Halfizi was wanted for the violent rape of a woman in Liverpool in 2009. Well, as a result of your calls, he was eventually traced to the Italian island of Sicily and brought back to stand trial. In June, he was convicted of rape and jailed for six years. Another great result. Finally, news of some CCTV from January's programme. It showed two men violently attacking the owner of the Gonka Mini Market in Finsbury Park in North London with a knife and a gun. Well, thanks to Crime Watch viewers, the two attackers were identified as 20-year-old Levi Ingram and 16-year-old Denzel Sasser. Both pleaded guilty in July, with Ingram receiving a nine-year prison sentence, Sasser six years. An excellent result. Now, just take a look at this. It is the head of a black rhinoceros. It was shot in Kenya back in 1923. Pound for pound, would you believe it, its horns are worth almost twice as much as gold. And it's that value which has increasingly led to the horns being targeted by thieves here in the UK. In fact, all across the world it's happening. Here to explain, DC Ian Lawson from the Mets Art and Antiques Unit and DC David Pellet from Surrey Police. Uh, can you explain to me, first of all, Ian, why are they so valuable? Well, rhino horn is uh, ground down uh, and used in traditional medicines in Asia. It's actually made of keratin, which is the same substance as in fingernails and uh, toenails. And experts have actually concluded that uh, it has the same medicinal benefits as biting your nails. Right. And nevertheless, uh, these horns here that you see are worth about £250,000 each on the illicit market in Asia. That is incredible. And presumably then they sit in museums and they're a pretty easy target. Absolutely, but we've been warning museums and collectors uh, to basically review their security, uh, to take the horns off display if necessary, and also to uh, place, replace them with reproductions. OK. Uh, David, you've recently uh, had some problems with this on your patch. Tell us about it. Show us some CCTV. That's correct. We had a burglary at Hazelmere Museum in May this year where a rhino head was stolen. 
We have CCTV oh. footage of the offenders breaking in, going to a display cabinet and then making off to the rhino head. That's extraordinary. How long were they actually in the museum for? Uh, approximately 90 seconds, and we believe they must have known the layout of the premises. OK, you've also got some other very interesting CCTV. This, this was from the day before. Two days before. Two days before. Tell me what happened. These three guys are wandering around the museum, uh, don't appear to be taking any notice of the display cabinets. They're just uh, wandering around. Don't know if these men are involved, but we would like to speak to them. Yeah, so if anybody recognises them, or the men themselves would like to come forward, you would very much be interested to talk we to them. Um, do you know who any of those blokes are on the CCTV? If so, then please do call us tonight in the studio. There's the number, 0500 600 600. Now, last time on Crime Watch, we told you about the conviction of a 39-year-old Italian man, Danilo Restivo, for the 2002 murder of mum of two, Heather Barnett. It's a case that we have featured several times over the years, and Crime Watch viewers ended up playing what was a pivotal role in the prosecution's case. Mum? I just looked at Terry and said, I know something's wrong. I don't know where she is, but I think she's in the bathroom. Just opened the bathroom Mom, door because it was shut, and, and there she was. Mom? In November 2002, Heather Barnett's children came home to find that their mother had been brutally murdered and mutilated in their Bournemouth home. Somebody had hit her numerous times over the head with a hammer and after death had dragged her to another part of the house where he'd mutilated her body. Not only did he bizarrely remove Heather's breasts, but he also uh, clearly had a hair fetish. He'd obviously cut Heather's hair and placed it in her left hand, but in her right hand was somebody else's hair. But it would take nine years of tireless police surveillance, groundbreaking forensic work, and evidence from a shockingly similar murder in Italy before this man, Danilo Restivo, would finally be convicted for his terrible crime. Heather was a kind person, she was very hard-working, she was a seamstress, and I think she just existed to make sure that her children had a great life. So why would anyone want to kill her? Detectives believed the murder had been planned with chilling precision. The killer brought a change of clothes and had been incredibly forensically aware. There was no fingerprints that uh, related to the killer. Uh, we found a number of dark fibres uh, around on Heather's body, on the uh, bathroom door in blood, um, and we were quite convinced that the killer had been wearing gloves at the time. But for all the care the killer had taken not to leave fingerprints or DNA, he'd left a shoe print in blood. From analysing that uh, shoe print, we were able to establish that the shoe was a Nike Terrapart training shoe of a size 9.5 to 10.5. And, and that's not all he'd left behind. Police found a green hand towel which didn't belong to Heather but had her blood on it. Police were convinced that the suspect was local and would have a connection to Heather and her children. Danilo Restivo lived opposite and was one of the first to be questioned. Uh, he'd been over a couple of days before. He'd asked her to make some curtains. And after that visit, strangely, her keys had gone missing. When he was questioned, Restivo denied any knowledge of the keys, but was quick to provide an alibi for the morning Heather was killed, even though he wasn't a suspect at that stage. Right. And his behaviour became even more suspicious, when officers found the trainers he'd been wearing that day soaked in bleach. Somebody who was forensically aware would know that that would destroy the, uh, the DNA and remove any traces of the crime scene from those shoes. Was this Restivo covering his tracks and cleaning the trainers he'd changed into after killing Heather? You know, we wanted to know everything about Danilo Restivo and that led us to Italy and we spoke to the Italian authorities and it revealed a, a past which was deeply concerning to us. Speculation was rife in his hometown of Potenza in Italy that he'd killed teenager Elisa Klaps, who went missing in 1993 after arranging to meet Restivo at a local church. But Restivo, seen here in court, denied killing her and without Elisa's body, 
there simply wasn't enough evidence to convict him of her murder. He was released and subsequently left for the UK. If Restiva had killed Elisa Claps, then he'd gotten away with it. He would have been extremely confident. He would have understood the forensic implications. He would have understood he needed to plan. And was he going to kill again? Detectives were so concerned about what Restivo might do next that they put him under round-the-clock surveillance. It would turn out to be a crucial and potentially life-saving decision. He was in the area of Throop. Uh, it's down near uh, an old mill, and it's uh, an area where lone females go and walk their dogs. Restivo had taken an identical set of clothes with him. Here he is, filmed by undercover officers, getting changed and then watching women from the bushes. He was out effectively stalking lone females and his actions were very predatory. But in the end, Restivo seemed to get spooked and went home. So the next day, I was back in my office and again there was that phone call from the surveillance team saying, boss, we're really, really worried this time. What's he up to? So I made a decision okay. that, uh, that we would intervene. We still wanted to carry on our COVID tactics, so uh, I sent down a couple of uniform officers to ask him some questions under the pretext that there had been thefts in the area. I stayed on the phone and I knew that they'd approached him. They'd asked to see what was in his bag and what was in his car. Chillingly, they found a large filleting knife. They found two pairs of scissors. They found gloves, balaclava, wipes and tissues effectively his murder bag. Restivo was clearly a danger to the public, but the police took the decision to seize his murder kit and to let him go while they continued their covert surveillance. He would be watched very closely while officers searched for a direct link between Restivo's disturbing behavior and Heather's death. Clearly the killer had a hair fetish Local people started to tell us that women had had their hair cut whilst travelling on buses in Bournemouth. I was convinced it was the same person. Detectives were sure that the hair fetish would be a crucial part of the inquiry and wanted to reach out to as many potential victims as possible. And you're pretty sure he knew Heather, which means he was probably local. Tell us about this fascination you had with, with hair. This is as heavy as a telephone directory. These are the calls that have come in tonight on the killer of Heather Barnett. Two women came forward to say they'd had their hair cut, uh, and a further lady came forward to say that she'd observed somebody having their hair cut, and she would later identify Restivo as the person that had cut that hair. A viewer also called in to say that she recognised this man, shown on grainy CCTV, walking away from Capstone Road, where Heather lived, around the time she was killed. She said it was Danilo Restivo. This previously unseen crime watch footage shows the moment Restivo was arrested and questioned about the hair-cutting assaults in November 2006. But it would be another three years before breakthroughs in forensics would mean they could charge him with Heather's murder. I was always waiting for that call for someone to tell me that uh, you know, the offender's DNA had been found on the towel, um, and eventually it did. Scientists using a new technique had been able to extract a partial profile of the killer, and it was a positive match to Restivo, with a 1 in 57,000 chance of it belonging to anyone else. He'd taken that towel with him um, to wipe Heather's blood from his hands. Everything else had been, he thought, meticulously planned, but he left one thing behind. When Restivo was questioned, he stuck with the story that he had taken the towel over to Heather as a colour match for the curtains. No one believed him, and when a new technique was used to examine his bleached trainers, more damning evidence came to light. Almost immediately that the scientist uh, sprayed the inner sole of these trainers with the chemical, it came up purple, which really showed that Restivo had put blood-stained feet into those shoes. Then, in March 2010, another piece of the puzzle fell into place. Italian police, who'd been conducting a review of the Elisa Claps case, finally found her body, mummified in the roof of the Italian church, where she'd gone to meet Restivo 17 years previously. We believe that Daniela Restivo had uh, taken Alicia Claps into that roof space 
um, sexually assaulted her, brutally stabbed her, and uh, during that process had uh, cut her hair. Very similar acts that had occurred during Heather's murder. In May last year, with now convincing forensics and special permission to use the new evidence from the reopened Italian investigation, the police again arrested Restivo, this time for murder. During the trial, Restivo finally admitted that he got a hair fetish. There he was, in the court, facing the jury, saying, yes, I'm a weirdo, I like cutting hair. I get some sort of gratification from it. The jury returned a unanimous verdict after just five hours. He was jailed for life for Heather's murder, and the judge made it clear that he was sentencing Restivo as if he'd killed before. You know, he's a, a brutal individual I don't think will ever get into his mind. Unfortunately, we weren't able to prevent Heather Barnett's murder, but we did prevent further murders, and uh, Daniela Restivo is in the right place for the rest of his life. Horrific. Uh, Matthew, mm -hmm. Heather's children were 11 and 14 when they found her body. Yeah, the murder, the mutilation, the way that Restivo had almost designed the crime scene so that Heather would be found by her children, it, it's beyond belief. In her victim impact statement, Heather's daughter, Caitlin, described the nightmares, the flashbacks that she suffered, and said it was several years before she could accept the help of a child psychologist to help her cope with what she'd seen and what had happened. And the hair, so odd. Yes, he was a sadist, a sexual predator, and the hair thing was all part of that. When detectives searched his house, they found clumps of hair hidden in his wardrobe. I mean, he was a time bomb. The police recognised that. That surveillance operation that you saw probably saved the lives of other women. But the, the science here was absolutely crucial mm. because Restivo was incredibly forensically aware, but he had no idea how those techniques would develop and ultimately trap him just years later. And what about this poor young girl, Elisa, in Italy, the mummified body in the church? Well, the Italians want to put him on trial for that murder. The extradition proceedings have already started. I mean, everything about this case is grim, apart from the fact that they caught him and that he'll never be released from prison. And also one thing that Caitlin said. She said that she refused to just sit there and be sad, and she and her brother Terry were determined to grab every opportunity in life and be adults that their mum would be proud of. So Restivo took virtually everything that was precious from them, but not their strength and not their spirit. We wish them all the best in that, Matthew. Thank you very much indeed. Right, it's time for a last quick update from Rav. Thanks, Kirsty. We've had some good calls coming in already. First of all, with Helensborough, we've had four names now suggested for the arsonist that uh, led to these two youngsters losing their life so tragically. Uh, we've also had some potential witnesses uh, possibly named from the CCTV that we appealed from, so hopefully uh, we can identify some of those. We do need that caller desperately to phone back that Kirsty appealed for earlier. Uh, Waltham Cross, we showed you this man concerned in a rape. We must have more information on him. If you can possibly help, do please get in touch. OK, that's everything for now. There's lots more on the website, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. If you need to see anything again, all the reconstructions and CCTV are also now viewable on your smartphone or on your tablet. The lines stay open until midnight tomorrow, so you've still got time to help. We're going to be back again in 35 minutes after the news with the very latest on what's come in tonight. If you call from Helensborough on the arson, if that was you, call back now.